test. All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. As always, we get a good turnout in the village. Uh, my name is Matt Walsh. For those who haven't met me, I'm the, the police chief. I came here in October. With me is our new director of police operations, Larry Rafferty. We worked uh, off and on for 30 years with Cook County and with Tinley Park. Just a little bit about his resume. He's going to be working with the operations and the detectives. He's worked on over 350 homicides. He's uh, uh, put together the policies and procedures for me when I was at Tinley Park. He just brings a lot of experience. He put together some beat meetings where we go meet, go to the different neighborhoods and talk about the problems like we're doing here. And uh, we're going to continue that here. However, when I got here, I was pleasantly surprised because Rob Verber has been doing it already, and he does an excellent job. We had the Secret Service out here, and Rob helped do the presentation. He has a pretty lengthy presentation tonight. I'm not going to talk any more about it because I want to bring Rob up. He, has, he had to cut slides out. There's so much that's going on and so many things he wants to talk about. So, Officer Berber. Uh, before we get into the actual presentation and my introduction to myself, I want to bring er everyone up to date as to the mail theft that's been going on, not only in our community, but the area as well. Uh, just this past January 2015th, or 20, uh, 25th, I should say, a very alert uh, Crestwood police officer was making a routine, if there ever is one traffic stop. The end result of that was a finding multiple bags, trash bags of unopened mail in the rear seat of the vehicle. They made the connection to quite a few of the mail thefts that occurred in, in Palos Heights. They contacted the Palos Heights Police Department. They, in turn, started a legal process, got search warrants, obtained those search warrants, to, uh, served search warrants on the uh, apartments or units of the, uh, doesn't show up on a TV, the pointer, uh, these three despicable individuals, and yes, I did use the word despicable, uh, these characters who were involved in mail theft. Not only in my next slide, I'm going to have all the different towns, but just to give you a sense as to what exactly they were doing, uh, they were uh, actually accessing the mailboxes themselves with the key. Now, one would ask themselves, how do you obtain a key to a blue box? Those are the boxes that you typically put your mail into, and then a mailman then retrieves that mail and brings it to the post office. You can ob obtain those keys very easily, either by theft or on the black market, which is typically the deep web or the dark web. So those can be obtained. And we're going to talk a little bit more about mail theft a little bit later on in the presentation. But I wanted to give everybody uh, the scope of the uh, racket that they had going. And these are all the communities, including Indian Head Park, that was involved in these. And that's just the beginner's list. They figured that there are probably several more communities that were involved. Now, out of the Indian Head Park communities, there wasn't any that were in Ashbrook. We had an incident uh, late last year, and I'm going to show you a video of that later in the presentation, uh, because all the addresses that they had received or obtained that mail from were on Blackhawk Drive, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if I put that up on here. Yeah, Blackhawk Trail, the 6400, and the 6600 uh, Blackhawk Trail, as well as the 6600 block of Cochise Drive. My best educated guess is, if you happen to live in either one of those areas or know of anyone, the mail was still unopened, remained unopened. So all that mail was returned to the Postmaster General, who then, in turn, put it back into the system to be delivered. So I don't want anyone to uh, be concerned that their mail was intercepted. Yes, it was intercepted. However, it wasn't opened. So the mail continued on with its process. It just took a little vacation in these characters' uh, apartment. So that's what we've got going on with the mail theft. And we're going to talk quite a bit more about that later on in the presentation. Good evening, everyone. I'm Officer Rob Verber. I've been a police officer for going on 35 years now. 10 of those, uh, 32 of those, 10 years of those 32, with, those, with another agency, I was doing our crime prevention as well as a school resource officer. But what I want to drill down into tonight is everything that I do as a crime prevention and a community relations officer. Today, we're going to talk about the science of scams, the strategies used, actual scams and cons, and things we can do to keep us safe, different strategies that we can use. And a lot of this, shocking, you're going to hear about it. I'm going to touch on it quite a bit. It's based in physiology. Everything with a fear factor, greed, generosity, those are the three things that I'm going to dial into. Those are the three things that get us into trouble. Spoiler alert. Can you play the video, please?
I never thought I was the kind of person to fall for a scam. That's the words of a financial advice columnist that went viral last week for a piece titled, The Day I Put $50,000 in a Shoebox and Handed It to a Stranger. New York Magazine's Charlotte Cowles recounts that one Halloween she got a call from crooks spinning this elaborate and fictional tale, and it worked. Here's what happened. First, a caller posing as an Amazon employee told her she was a victim of identity fraud. Then another scammer impersonated the Federal Trade Commission, who said 22 bank accounts, nine vehicles, and four properties were allegedly registered in her name. And then finally, someone claiming to be a CIA investigator convinced her to withdraw tens of thousands of dollars from her bank account and hand it to them for safekeeping. Financial columnist for New York Magazine's The Cut, Charlotte Cowles, joins us now with more on her story. I mean, this is incredible. And I think it had to be really hard for you to come forward and tell this story. Why did you decide to do it? It is deeply embarrassing. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to tell this story because there really is no stereotypical scam victim. And I know this from my own personal experience, obviously. But um, also the hundreds of emails that I've received from other people since this story came out um, other financial professionals, their doctors, their lawyers, their government employees. There are people of all walks of life who this happens to. And this is also backed up by data and research that's done on scam victims. There really is no one type of person who's vulnerable. You wrote that several friends felt, uh, felt strongly that if the scammers hadn't mentioned your son, right, uh, kind of talking about your family in the context of this, that you would not have fallen for it. In hindsight, is there a moment you think you would have changed? Oh, there are so many moments. <laughs> but I think that these scammers are really good at what they do. That's the reason they keep doing it, is that it works. And we should and say you were kind of passed off in multiple phone calls. It's yeah. not like you just got an email no. and replied back with a box of cash. No, no. They didn't come out of the gate and ask for money. Um, it unfolded very gradually uh, and incrementally over over five hours on the phone. Um, and I think that what these people do is they're very good at targeting people, figuring out their one specific vulnerability. Everyone has one, at least, and then exploiting that. And for me, it was my family. And they had very intimate details about me, about my family members. They knew where I lived. They knew the last four digits of my social security number. They knew about my son, um, and it was terrifying. It's just dastardly. I mean, yeah. it really is just the lowest of low. I mean, was there anywhere where your radar went off? Was there a moment where you're like, you know, this, this doesn't feel right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the whole time, none of it felt right. But the tiny chance that what they were saying was actually true was terrifying enough that I was willing to cooperate. And the things that they were threatening were so terrifying that, you know, that tiny voice that says, what if they're right, um, that was enough to make me listen and stay on the phone with them. One of the things that struck me about this story is the isolation of it. When it's happening to you and also afterwards, we're hearing about like sextortion with teen boys. We're hearing about all kinds of other scams that really seem to point to people feeling like they had nowhere to turn. You're married, you had a family. Can you talk about that instinct to not reach out for help? Absolutely. There's actually a name for this. It's called blocking the exits. And, um, and it, it's a, a really effective manipulation tactic. And, Where they um, make it seem like you can't contact this yeah, person, don't. don't. You're under surveillance, you're being watched, your phone is tapped, your computer's been hacked. They really make it seem like you have nowhere to turn. Um, in this particular instance, I was also home by myself. I was working from home. Um, and so under any other circumstances, of course, I mean, my best friend is a lawyer. Like, I, <laughs> I have, I have an incredible support system around me and they really made me feel like I couldn't talk to anyone. That's the part that you, it makes me just, oh, just so uncomfortable. You're, you're home alone, just how um, awful you must have felt the whole time. After your story, I emailed my family and said, no matter what happens, you can tell me. So, yeah. so help us through this. I mean, what does everyone who's watching this need to know that they have to do if, if they start going down a road like this? Yeah, absolutely. So 
I think the first thing is that you can never really prepare for how you're going to react when someone threatens your family. So everyone thinks that they're, you know, they would never fall for something like this. I, th I thought that I would never fall for something like this. Um, so the best way that you can prepare is to think of a couple of people who you can trust, who you would reach out to in a situation like this, and then think of the ways that you would get off the phone if you really had to. Why? Make up a reason. Say you have to go to the bathroom. Say that, you know, you're losing cell phone service. And just slow down, take a beat, call someone, reach out to someone else. It's the best way to do a gut check and really get yourself out of a situation when you're in over your head. Thanks for doing this. I know it couldn't have been easy. Thank you. Uh, I think it's really important what you've done here, and I hope people are paying attention. She had mentioned in there blocking the exit, and that is exactly as to what occurs. Uh, they keep you on the phone for an inordinate amount of time, and they insist that you don't hang up, you don't tell anybody. So everything that she had described, uh, everything that she had espoused was exactly what occurs. Now, this was a family, like a hostage-type hoax, but that could apply to the Microsoft Windows tech scam as well, or any of the other scams. We're going to talk about the uh, Publishers Clearinghouse scam and several other scams as well. So everything that she had talked is spot on, or talked about is spot on, and exactly as to what occurs, the dynamics of what makes these happen. So before we can even get into the actual scams themselves, we have to talk about the science. But good old Maslow, he described back in the early, I think it was the 40s, if I'm not mistaken, Nathan Maslow, the very fundamental portion of us as being, as a human being, just above our psychological needs, is the need for safety. And if we don't have safety, we cannot build upon the other things the love, caring, confection, self-esteem, and the existentialism. We need that safety. So that's what brings us out here tonight. What we try to do, or what I'm going to try to do this evening, is empower you. I call it self-advocacy. We want you to be able to spot and recognize these types of crimes for what they are and be able to take action. And I'm going to mention several times throughout the presentation, no one, I repeat, no one has the right to take advantage of you or make you do things that you know are inherently wrong. You can always reach out to us at the police department if you don't have a support at home, whether it be an adult child, a neighbor, uh, a friend, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever the situation might be, spouse. You have somebody that you can reach out to if you are victim or fall victim to these types of scams or cons. Simply call, hey, Officer Rob, can I come over? I'll put you in a chair right next to me at one of our desktops. We'll log on to your, whatever your account is or whatever the situation is within reason because we don't want to pick up a virus. And we're going to walk you through it and say, hey, you know what, this is a scam, just simply delete it. We may print it off on paper and then walk you through that because we don't want to subject our, our, uh, our Internet system, our computer system to anything that might be malware, and we're going to talk about that here in a moment. And that's what really gets folks into trouble. When you're cruising around on the Internet and you're clicking on things randomly, you pick up a virus, you pick up a bug. Next thing you know it, you get the Microsoft Windows tech support scam. So the good news is, as far as seniors, because we're predominantly everyone over is pretty much over the age of 55, including yours truly. As we become older, the good news is we are less likely to become the victim of a physical attack. Well, why is that? We're typically in the home more often. We're typically closer to our house. So back when you were in your 30s, 40s, early 50s, you're probably more uh, susceptible to a, to a crime, armed robbery, carjacking, that type of crime, because you're out of the house due to the fact that you were younger. The bad news is, being seniors, or those folks that are older, our older Americans, I have to change my vernacular, is that you're not as alert to frauds, scams, and cons because you're home more often. They have a captive, air quote, captive audience that's there for you. So less of a physical threat, more of a cyber or technical type kind of threat, and they target, uh, they target you guys, they target that age group. And that isn't just here in, uh, in Indian Head Park. This is nationwide, this is global. This happens in Europe, it happens in Canada, the United States, it happens everywhere, these types of crimes. So crime prevention, well, I'm gonna read it verbatim, is the anticipation, recognition, and appraisal of a crime risk and the initiative of some action to remove or reduce it. That's exactly what we're doing here this afternoon. So elements, uh, for elements for crime to occur, as a crime prevention practitioner, we have something that we call the crime prevention triangle. Now there's three parts to a triangle. The first part, keeping this in mind for a, uh, whether it be a crime, a scam, a con, is the desire of the bad guy. That's, desi that's based on opportunity and the criminal's need for money or drugs. We can't remove desire 
and we certainly can't remove the ability, which is the ability to actually commit that crime or perpetrate that scam or con. But what we can eliminate in the crime prevention triangle is the opportunity, and we're doing that right now as we sit here, as we speak through what we call education, because if we remove the opportunity, think of, a, uh, think of a table with three legs. You remove that third leg, the table collapses, correct? In this case, our crime prevention tri uh, triangle implodes because we remove the opportunity through education. We can't affect the desire, we can't affect the ability, but we can remove the opportunity. Good old Edgar Allan Poe said it however long ago, believe nothing you hear and only one half that you see. It's true. As we take it in the context of scams, cons, and frauds or any type of a crime, that is really true, especially in the tech support uh, type scam, the grandparent scam, we're gonna be talking about those, the money scam, it is so very true. As I said earlier, as a spoiler alert, it's based upon physiology. There's three things, or the science of scams, there's three things that get us in trouble as humans. The first of which is fear. That's typically the IRS scam. Hey, you're gonna be sent to jail or someone's gonna to come to your house, serve a subpoena, you're gonna be arrested, you're gonna be sent away to the gulag. That's the fear portion. The third, or the second I should say, is greed. Now in the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes uh, scam, they say you've won, it's, it's always in February, this year, we came out unscathed. Last year, I had, I had taken a report or two in regards to the publisher's clearinghouse scam. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I didn't even know that existed until I took the report and had to do some research. That scam exists. So we have the greed, who doesn't want to come into a windfall of X amount of dollars for whatever it is, or any type of a, a monetary or a product or so on and so forth. And then the last is a generosity. That's where the grandparent scam typic uh, typically gets us. And notice how I say us. It isn't just you, it's everybody. It's including myself. Just because I carry a gun doesn't mean that I don't receive these emails or these texts or these phone calls. While we were sitting here talking with Dave, I don't know how many phone calls that were spam that I just basically deleted, never answered, they went, or went to voicemail. Nine times out of 10, they hang up. So I say us, because collectively, we're combating this as we speak, together, collectively. So the greed is what gets us in the grandparent scam or the disaster scam. Now, phishing, with a PH, not an FI, that is a type of fraud where someone is going to send out malicious or fraudulent information to try to get information back. That is a part of social engineering. Now, here are some of the examples of what your information is worth. Now, go across the chart, and this is just a small wedge of a much larger pie of the different types of dollar amounts that are associated with your data, with your information. And we can see with the medical records alone, at the uh, very bottom, far left, or far right, I should say, up to $1,000 for any type of medical information. Now, some of them are very sundry, uh, you know, 70 cents to $2.30 for your email or a password, uh, buck 50 for your PayPal credentials, so on and so forth. But this can give you a sense of how lucrative, and, you, and please understand, these aren't one, onesie twosies, aren't ones off, one off. And some of the pictures you're gonna see, I actually show you pictures of the inside of scam call centers. They're a room of this size with probably 15, 20, 30, 35 computers and they're all in a little cubby and that's all they do all day long. Now, I don't want to disparage people from certain parts of the, of the planet, but a lot of these happen in South Africa, the Ukraine, the Philippines, India. A lot of them happen, New Delhi to be specific. These are all offshore, the lion's share of them. And if they originated here, they eventually they go back there. We're going to talk about the one where we had a resident that lost a considerable amount of money just, last, uh, just a few weeks ago. So Voltaire came up with a really great, uh, uh, this is 1600 somewhere along those lines. It was since plagiarized by Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility. It didn't actually come from Peter Parker initially. It came from Voltaire, French poet, writer, great writer actually. That applies to scams and cons. Having this technology, having this great power, we have to be responsib responsible while we're actually operating with it, while we're actually using it. Am I browbeating you? No, not at all. But what I am trying to impress upon you is that we have to take cautions, we have to take actions, and I'm arming you, I'm giving you all the skill sets, all, uh, skill sets, all the information here this evening that when you see these types of fraud, scams, and cons, you can recognize them for what they are and you can act upon them appropriately. So social engineering, which is a part of phishing, uses three sneaky st uh, strategies to get you. They're gonna create a connection. 
They're going to try to say, hey, what type of hobbies, what type of crafts, what type of things are you interested in to try to develop that connection because they want that one-on-one -on -one connection. Because please understand, these scams evolve over a period of hours, hours, if not sometime even days, weeks, and in some instances, even months before the final shoe drops and they do the ask for the money. So they want to develop that connection. Second thing they want to do, they want to establish credibility. They're going to put up logos, signs, uh, types of uh, emojis, anything that's associated with a legitimate company to establish that credibility. They'll use the word Microsoft, and we're going to talk about that extensively here in the presentation. And then the third, they're going to play on your emotions. As we talked about, fear, greed, and generosity. And that's going to come up a lot, and I'm actually going to hold up a little flashcard to kind of dial in on that rather than going back to the slides, because you really truly need to understand that this is based in physiology. They're playing off our gray matter. These are just common, everyday types of emotions that we have, but they're playing those, and they're playing it rather well. And we need to fight back. Remember, no one has the right to make you do things you don't want to do or that you know are inherently wrong. So these are type the, some of the messages that you might get in your computer. To the left are the actual um, uh, pop-up that you would receive on your machine, and we'll explain how that actually occurs. And then to the right is some of the verbiage or some of the uh, words that you may, that may be associated with that. I've got a couple of them on here. This is just to give you a, a sense as to what you may see if you haven't already seen it. I would hazard a guess that at least one person in this room has probably been fallen victim to the Microsoft tech support scam or any type of scam con or fraud. You may or may not have reported it, and a lot of people don't, especially our older Americans, for the simple fact that there's some embarrassment and there's shame that's associated with that, and there shouldn't be. You need to come in and let us know. But these are just a few of them that we would normally see. It's always, you could see a common thread in all those. Now, what do we talk about? Establishing credibility. They're from Microsoft, using certain words, certain verbiage, giving you a number. The 844 number is the death number right there, or the 888. Uh, those are the ones where they predominantly come from, and then the, eight, uh, the 833 is another one. Anything with that, uh, that prefix or that suffix in there, you can be guaranteed that it's more likely than not, it's, it's a scam at least with the Microsoft tech support scam here. So you land on a malicious website, malicious website. So what happens when you do it? Now this could be something as innocuous as you're, uh, you like playing, I have a certain family member who enjoys playing the different small games on there, uh, whether it be Sudoku or the video poker, or any, any of those types of games. You have those little pop-up ads that come up occasionally. I think we may or may not have seen those. Well, just by clicking on those, not closing it out with the X, but by clicking on some of those, this is only one small example, there may very well be malicious malware or a virus or a bug that's attached to that. As soon as you click on that, that's when things begin to go sideways. That's when you start to get the fake Microsoft pop-up appears, the ones that I had just shown you. Nothing that you did, nothing that you did. It may be something that was, it could be an adult entertainment site that pops up or, hey, I know you're in the area, I want to talk to you. And some people just out of curiosity rather than closing it, or maybe inadvertently didn't think that they were clicking on the, the, uh, the image itself, but maybe on the X or vice versa, they clicked on the actual ad, which now uploads the malware or the virus. And then moments later, you get that Microsoft tech support scam that's using fear to get you to comply to their demands by establishing credibility, using certain logos, and trying to get that commonality between the, the both of you. So you call the tech support number, thinking, you know what, mea copa, mea copa. I, I, they're going to shut my computer down. They're going to come to my house. They're going to send me nasty letters. They're going to take away my computer. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And people will panic. We've been taking these reports, unfortunately. And they don't typically report to us until after the scam. And we'll go into those more specifically. Until after the damage has been done and they're out thousands upon thousands of dollars. That's the part that it, it, it's, it's so heartbreaking to sit across an interview room table here at the station and have a lady come in and it's pretty much three quarters, a half, whatever number, numerical number you want to assign to it, that's their life savings that have just been taken. And if you go into some of the, like me and Dave were talking about earlier, and we're not going to go into that here, but there's actual YouTube channels where these guys are actual, uh, they do the reverse scam on these people. And if you could hear the things that these people from these different countries are saying, Kitboga is one of the bigger ones, 
Scammer Revolts is another one. I can't think of the third one. Me and Dave were talking about that. If you could hear the attitude that they have towards those of us that are here in the North American continent, it's disgusting. Apparently, we have a surplus of money that we can just lose. They can scam seniors out of their life savings and think nothing of it. That's why we need to fight back. No one has the right to make you do things you don't want to do or do things that you know that are inherently wrong. We need to fight back. So the scammer confirms the uh, security threat. He'll say, and I, like I said, I don't want to be disparaging because I know this is being broadcast, and, you know, but it is what it is. They'll come back, typically in a foreign voice, and they're going to tell you that your computer is infected and you need to remove that information immediately. They'll even try to sell you a subscription. We'll talk about how a lady lost $34,500, which started off with a $349 subscription to remove that material. Shocker, or spoiler alert, there is no fee to remove that. I should bring it to a tech support person, but no one's going to be able to do that online. And we'll get into that. Now what they're going to do, which makes this so insidious, they'll make you believe that they now have to install software on your machine to then take control of it. Folks will sit there, and they'll actually watch their mouse, their cursor actually move around the screen. Well, what they'll do is they'll put up a, uh, an avatar or something, a screen to block while they're going into your files. They now have full access to your machine, your banking accounts, your checking accounts, your personal information, your contacts, phone numbers, banking information, everything that you would ever keep on your machine, your laptop, your desktop. They are now going through that to try to not only build the ruse, but also steal that data as well. Now, some of us may keep, in, in a Word doc or something, we may keep our social security number, passwords, passcodes of certain websites, internet uh, applications that we might use. They're taking all that information as, as you are speaking to them over the phone, because you believe that they're helping you by gaining access to your machine. So the scammer deal, uh, steals your data, your money, your hard-earned cash, and they take that and it's then shipped overseas, and we'll tell you a couple, or I'll show you a couple ways exactly as to how that occurs to, uh, through crypto, uh, cryptocurrency, which is only one of them. So in summary, the Microsoft tech support scam. If you get that blue screen or that verbiage or a combination thereof saying that your computer's gonna be shut down, you're gonna lose your computer, mea copa, mea copa, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, stop, pump the brakes, hit the reset button, and call somebody that's close to you that you can actually go over that with. And gosh darn it, you can even call the police department, like I said earlier. Ask for myself or one of the other officers. We'll come in, we'll go to you or meet you halfway. Talk to somebody else to get a second pair of eyes on that. 99.9% .9 of the time, if not 100% of the time, it's a ruse. And they're playing on your fear, right? They're playing on your fear. It's based in physiology something that we have no control over through removing the opportunity though through education correct we can't remove the desire we can't remove the ability but we can remove the opportunity and we can only do that through education and that's why I'm so glad that you guys are out here and we're also televising this as well so stay cyber secure these are I'm not going to go through each and every one of these but the, there I could probably just do an hour presentation just on the different scams I'm not going to do that to you death by PowerPoint no I'm going to do it these are just some of the many scams. I got three or four slides on it. Tech support, utility shut off, pay yourself, the romance scam. Let's just stop there for a moment. Uh, that typically, as you shocker, February is typically where the romance scam usually comes into play. And I don't want to say any disparaging to people that are either alone or possibly a widower. It could be a male or a female. But when you're alone for a period of time and somebody comes on the internet, you're on those dating sites, and oh, shocker alert, Christian singles or Christian mingles and all, they're not all Christians on there. They ain't. We've worked the cases. They're not all Christians on it, because if they were Christians, they certainly won't be doing what they're doing. They go from plenty of fish to Christian singles to farmer.com or whatever there are, or I like, uh, I like tractor equipment, or you know, there's just there's dozens, there's scores of these different uh, sites that are up. Now, there might be a portion of those people that are actually truly legitimate, but what, it's a scammer's playground to go onto there and then scam you out of money in the romance scam. Um, then you got the imposter scam and the home closing. It doesn't happen somewhere else. This is where we get into the meat and potatoes. It doesn't happen somewhere else. Spoiler, we got the Indian Park logo on there. 
the tech support scam. This is the one that I've been talking about. Just this year, within the last three, four weeks, um, classic Microsoft tech support scam. Um, I'll just say person, because we don't want to, even though I'm not going to give names. So we'll just say the person sitting at their computer screen. The Microsoft tech support scam pops up. Now remember what we talked about that, right? Oh, that ain't real. It's going to more likely, because you must have gone on a, on a website and uploaded inadvertently malware or a virus or a bug, which is going to generate that, which is connected to a real live person, not here in the United States, is going to generate that pop-up. They're going to say, oh, you need to pay the money. Well, this the technician will then instruct them that they need to install that software. Remember this, any desk, any view, my desk, remote viewing software to go on your computer. They actually see and help you help you remove the malicious software or whatever the problem might be with your machine. They're going to help you take that off. In this case, they offered a one-year uh, subscription to fix the problem. Now, the original price was $349. Well, she was handed off at least three or four times. I left that part out. You're not always talking to the exact same person. Remember, we talked about lending it some authenticity. So they're going to hand you off to three or four different people during that conversation. They're literally sitting right next to each other. No one's in a different room. No one's in Boise, Idaho. The other one's in Yakima, you know, uh, in the Yukon or uh, San Diego, California. They're, they're sitting in the same room, sharing the same air, breathing the same air. Hands are off to another uh, person who's going to take the money, the 349, and I'll fix it for you. Inadvertently moves the decimals one way or the other. Now it's 34,500. But wait, there's more. The scammer tells them, you know what? I made a mistake. I made an error. Ma'am, could you please, just please, I'm going to lose my job. If you, please, send me to 34,500 or else I'm going to lose my job. Now, you have to understand, this went on for hours. Hours. I'm going to say it one more time. Hours. They set it up really good. They got in really good. They got in sideways, leftwise, up, down, any, way you, any which way you can, top, bottom. This went on for hours. Well, unfortunately, our resident bit. She went to the bank, and she made two withdrawals, well, withdrawals which turned into checks. One was for 18000 and the second check was for 16500 Two separate checks. Now, how is that money going to leave her house and get to the scammer? Well, and here's where Officer Rob kind of fills in, because I actually haven't talked to the detectives here, but I, Darian had a very similar case, and this is pretty much how it went. They sent a rideshare driver. I'm not going to say the big two because I don't want to be caught in any type of a libel suit. They sent a, a, uh, a rideshare driver who, my best guess, wasn't involved. He was part of the, he was actually a victim himself being promised X, Y, Z if he went to go pick up this money. Well, they went up it to lend it some authenticity. Remember we talked about authenticity? I'm sure they, uh, the Uber driver, the rideshare driver, and we don't know if it's one of the two. It could have been any one of them. Uh, and we're, get, we're assuming it's a rideshare driver. Ask the gentleman for a, now this is my hypothesis. Do you have a dollar bill on you? Yes, I do. Read the dollar bill, the serial number off to us, the scammer. The scammer then communicates to the victim, this guy's going to pull up an XYZ car, an XY time, he's going to XYZ look, car, color. This is the dollar bill serial number. He is going to read this off to you. This is the only way that you're going to know that it's exactly as to who you need to give this money to. So what does the driver do? He pulls up. Victim goes up to the driver. Is it one, two, three, X, Y, Z? Yep, that's it. Boom, you must be the person I gave him the two checks for one for 18,000, the other one for 1650, uh, 550. And he drives off into the sunset. Now our victim eventually calls us. Now we have to do damage control. Well, now we have to put out the fire. Well, it's, it's far too late. Those checks are gone. Now, we do give, and I'm going to give you some great uh, information on how to do the, um, I call it damage control, on the back side of this. But I don't want to get into that quite yet. Um, that resident is now out $34,550 that they'll never see again. Now, understand, it may have started here in the U.S., but eventually those funds, having worked these cases and knowing how they, how they actually operate, the dynamics, how they actually work, how they operate, how they tick, that money was probably assuredly within moments after that or sometime shortly thereafter, sent overseas or put into an offshore bank account. South Africa, the Philippines, India, the Ukraine, 
pick a country. Those are the big, the big ones that are really the harbors of these boiler rooms, so to speak, that have these um, scam call centers. It probably managed to work its way back that way. Just last year, uh, tech support scam, same thing. Do you see the count? Do you see a thread in here? You're on the computer. Pop up pops up. You must have gone on something just moments earlier. You mal uh, up uploaded malicious uh, software, malware, a virus, a bug. Up pops the pop up. Technician gets on there, tells you, "Hey," after you make the phone call, "Hey, you got to you got to upload the remote desktop viewing software." They point out uh, they'll point out non-existent problems, playing on your emotions, playing on your fear again, physiology that they're going to either eliminate, close down, shut down, take away, whatever combination of words you may want to use, you're never going to have to be able to use your computer again because only they can fix it. Like I said earlier, stop, pump the brakes, hit the reset button, and talk to someone who you can trust or come to us. We're a great default. Come right to the police department. Call us, meet us, however you want to do that. In this particular instance, this is the one that really now that I got, I'm down to my fourth bullet point. Um, this is the one that really tugged at my heartstrings because this is the, this one I personally took. This is the one for $10,000. If you could have seen this resident's face, her deportment, her demeanor, I had her, I wasn't going to take the report in our, in our lobby. It was, just, it was just that, you just know. I had her come into one of our interview rooms and I sat her down. Silent. Dejected. Upset at herself. I couldn't convince her enough that it wasn't her fault. All she could, every other word was, it was my fault, it was my fault, it was my fault. I explained to them, you had no way of knowing. She, I go, you do now. I had to add some gallows humor. And she did chuckle, try to add some levity to a, situ a very bad situation. She does now how, know how it works, but at the time, she didn't know she was in the middle of a ruse. She had no way of knowing that. But like we talked about the crime prevention triangle, ability, desire, opportunity, we're going to remove the opportunity through training everybody and hopefully everybody that's viewing this at home as well. So through a digital wallet, which is PayPal, Venmo, it's just a fancy term for PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, um, they received a, um, let me back up just ever so slightly. They took the $10,000 and they were required to go to an area cryptocurrency machine a Bitcoin machine in the area. It was one of the gas stations. I can't remember exactly which one as to what it was. They then took that $10,000, inserted the cash into the machine, got a QR code, set up a virtual wallet through Venmo, Cash App, um, set that virtual wallet up, scanned the QR code, poof. There went the $10,000, never to be seen again. That was part of her life savings. Heartbreaking. Yeah, we have feelings when we take these reports. I do. You can't help but feel for somebody who was scammed that way. Remember, no one has the right to take advantage of you or make you do things that you know that are inherently wrong. You know that this isn't right, but they convince you. Um, that, mon that money went off to the technician. Last year, once more. Uh, and this particular one, we're talking $15,000. This one has a fantastic ending down to the very bottom bullet point there. A uh, gentleman comes in, another porter I, I took. Gentleman's on his banking, and um, a message appears. Mia copa, mia copa. Oh, the sky is falling. His bank is telling his bank is telling him they're going to suspend, suspend his account, freeze his funds. He'll never be able to get his money out again. He's going to go poor. He won't be able to pay his mortgage or his rent or send money to his grand, grandkids. He takes out $15,000. They keep you on the phone. This went on for hours hours and hours and hours you're driving to the bank you're on the phone with them they will not hang up on you or with or from you or if you do you have to promise to call them back or they'll call you back incessantly until you pick back up they don't want you talking to anyone they want to isolate isolate you they want to block your exit as how we opened up this presentation they want to block your exit they don't want you talking to anybody that can speak some rationale or some common sense into this not that we don't have common sense i'm not a, I'm not espousing that, but they want to isolate you, block the exit. Takes the 10,000, they're ready to ship that off. Gentleman's here, I bring him into my interview room, have that compassion, we have the talk, I go, hold on, where's the bank, it's close. I get on the horn, I call the bank. If you read that very last bullet point, I talk to the branch manager, he goes, Officer Verber, we were just about ready to send those funds had you not called. 
we got by, and I'm almost touching my fingers together. That's how close it was before this gentleman almost lost his $15,000. It was that close. That was a lucky one. That was a lucky one. And I called immediately on that, not saying that I saved the day. But I'm simply trying to illustrate as exactly as to how these operate, how these work. Last year, again, last year was a banner year for these. We're only into March. Now, mind you now, we already had, what, the 15, uh, we're at the 34,000. So that overshadows what we probably took just last year alone, just the one that happened already. Um, yes, this gentleman, now this, we're going to shift gears just ever so slightly, identity theft. Gentleman comes in. This one I took in the lobby because it wasn't too, too, uh, too sensitive, for lack of better words. Uh, receives a letter from a banking institution saying that the loan that he applied for to buy a new house wasn't approved. Well, there was only one problem with that. He didn't know who the bank was, and he hadn't opened up a loan to buy a house, nor was he planning on buying a house. So on that one, he actually took care of that before he had even arrived. He called the, the banking institution, the lending institution, explained the situation. They, in turn, contacted their fraud division. He needed a police report number. Please understand, m the majority, if not all the time, when you're coming to us, you're basically, uh, excuse me, you're basically seek, seeking out a report number because the fraud division, whether it be BMO or Chase or just pick any entity, they'll need that report number for their fraud division. There's a lot of off the, uh, retired police officers that are actually doing a lot of that work that are really into that and they're just that good. They get hired by these private entities to actually do these investigations. So when it comes, when it falls in our, it comes to our doorstep, it's, it's, sad and, it's sad, but it's true. I'm not going to tell you the reality of it. We're simply providing you with a report number and documenting it, doing a very good, well-written report with all the elements of the crime, what happened, and then giving them the report number in case that report numbers are FOIA'd or requested, and it can then go back to the uh, lending institution or the entity that's doing the investigation, and now they have additional facts. There are rare instances, or I shouldn't say rare, there are instances where we can, we can work those cases and we can find out who the perpetrator is, but they're becoming increasingly harder and harder and harder each and every month, it seems. I, could, I can't tell you by the end of this year how, if, there'll be, if we'll be able to investigate any of these at a, at a local level, a small department. Uh, you have your Chicago's and your New York's and San Diego's and LA and San Francisco. They have divisions that do just that. Those guys, that's all they do five days a week, eight hours a day. When you hit the smaller departments, we're either uh, ferreting that out to our, our federal partners, and I'll talk about that here in a moment, or like I said, we're taking the report because there's not much we can do because it's offshore. Once it leaves the confines of the continental or contiguous United States, it leaves this, the North American continent and goes elsewhere, we can't do very much as far as investigating. We can't investigate a crime in another country. And we're certainly not going to get Interpol. We're not trying to make light or, or, or belittle the, I mean, 34,500, I don't know, I'll, I'll Nah, maybe between all my holdings and whatnot, I may have 34,500. I don't have 34,500. That's, no, that's nothing to sneeze at. That's a considerable amount of money that this, that, uh, that this person lost. In 2022, this is our publisher clearinghouse scam. First time I'd ever made aware of it. I don't profess to know everything. I have to do research on things. This one came to our doorstep. I looked at the gentleman. I go, publisher's clearinghouse? What, Ed McMahon? He scammed you? Did he call you and tell you you're gonna, you got to give me money? <laughs> And this one, our resident receives a phone call, advised that they had won. Now, on a phone call, now what does Ed McMahon usually do? Shows at your door. Doesn't call you. There you go, with the big, card, with the big cardboard check that hopefully doesn't bounce. Uh, how do you put that in your, how do you do that for a, when you have your banking over the phone? I don't know, I'm making, making light of that. To claim the prize, our resident had to go out and purchase Two $500 gift cards. So let's do our rudimentary math. So that's $1,000, two $500 each gift cards. Then provide the redemption code that's on the back. You pull the sticker off. It's on the very back. Provided the redemption code. And those, ca those cards were drained inst instantaneously, automatically. That $500 went into the ether. $1,000, I should say, in total, into the ether. This is a very big and very lucrative scam. Like I said, I, had to do re I have to keep up on this stuff. Any police officer who's doing these types of investigations, we have to keep up on this because it's constantly changing, it's evolving, there's different scams, there's different ways. But we all saw the commonality in their fear. They play on your fear, greed, and generosity, right? We can't remove the ability, we can't remove the desire, but we can remove the opportunity. It's based in physiology, our gray matter, our brain, which they know and can play us 
They could play us like a harp. They could play us like a, a violin. And they know exactly how to do it because they're just that good. They're well-versed. They have scripts that they follow. They share these scripts with other frauditors. They have this down to a science. They're using science to their advantage. Can you play the video, please? This is on the publisher. February show. brings the Super Bowl, Valentine's Day, and Publishers Clearinghouse's annual award. But that brings scammers out of the woodwork. It's that time of year. Come on, Come on out here. Publishers Clearinghouse award season. And in 2022, some lucky winner will be getting $5,000 a week for life. Today's your big day. We have sent to you a winner notification letter. 87-year-old Marlene, who asked that we not use her last name, just got a voicemail saying she was the winner. Hello. And he seemed very sincere. They were holding my funds for me at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. Not just money, but a new car, too. A BMW. Police, she got suspicious because it was all a scam. In the first place, I was not entered in the sweepstakes. People who need money after the holidays are really vulnerable to these publishers' clearinghouse scams. That's because their big drawing is at the end of February, and the company is currently advertising on TV and social media. Michelle Florence, Marlene's goddaughter, worries other seniors may fall for it. Some people are like, well, maybe I did enter her. And, you know, before they know it, their whole life savings is gone. Besides calls, other victims are targeted with official-looking letters and checks that turn out to be fake. PCH now warns of scams on its website, saying it will never call to say you are a winner, and it will never ask you to pay taxes or legal fees up front. You never have to pay anything to claim your PCH prize. Marlene has one other tip for other winner hopefuls like her. They don't leave a message on your answering machine. <laughs> they come in person. So always don't waste your money. I'm John Mattery's KHOU 11 News. Um, not that I was hoping that we would get one, but I thought for sure. Lightning strikes twice with these guys. They're going to do it. And like I said earlier, I can't reiterate it enough amongst uh, a couple other things. This isn't just Indian Head Park. They're not targeting Indian Head Park residents. It just happens to be we... We've had quite a few Western Springs. We're going to talk about theirs in a little bit. Um, it happens worldwide, globally. We don't have a market on it, thankfully. Shocking, Western Springs. Um, I only just came, I'll be honest with you, I only just came across this through the patch, and I thought it was really interesting. Um, I'm going to assume, based upon my training and experience, that they were sitting at their computer, the pop-up message comes up, saying, mea culpa, mea culpa, the sky is falling. If you don't do what we need you to do, you're going you're, you're to lose your computer. You're going to get a blue screen of death. You'll never be able to use it ever again. It'll become a paperweight. The technician said, once they let him on there, that they had porn on the machine. Well, this couple, they were an older couple. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say there wasn't any porn. Just by reading the article, and I had to read it a couple of times. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't porn. It was a ruse to get them to comply. They withdrew money. They took 10,000 of that uh, uh, into, into Bitcoin, 11,500 in gift cards. Uh, let me say that one more time. 11,500 in gift cards from Home Depot. Now, mind you now, this occurred over a period of several hours, if not a day or two. I don't have all the particulars on it. This is Western Springs case. It's an active case. So I wasn't going to hound them for all the information. But this is just simply up there to give you a sense as to what's occurring. And $500 of that was used at, for Walmart gift cards as well. So you could see there was a substantial amount of money that was taken on this. And the ruse was that there was porn on this machine and due to fear, the owner of the machine thought, I, got, I, I can't let the wife find out about this, right? You know, or Helen, look at the, and they're probably looking at each other going, we don't look at any of that. That's actually on the computer. You know, I'm kind of dating, dating ourselves here. The point being, they're going to use whatever type of a uh, con or a ruse that they can to get you to believe that something's not the way that it is. So we've entered a whole, we're going to shift gears here, we've entered a whole new world with artificial general in, uh, intelligence, AGI. A lot of you typically uh, rattle it off as artificial intelligence. Artificial general intelligence is a set of prog uh, instructions or programs designed to learn all that is there is to be learned. It's AI on steroids. Now, I don't know, maybe in my lifetime, maybe not even in my daughter's lifetime, she's she'll be 22 in June, there's going to come a time where, I mean, you've seen um, 
with Arnold Schwarzenegger with the, with the bots and all that stuff and the machine terminator and all that. We're going in that direction with, with the way that these auto we have autonomous cars that hasn't been quite uh, ferreted out yet exactly as to how they work and the safety level. But there's going to come a time where you can literally drive your car. You could pop, put your headrest back and, dr and operate your motor vehicle. I don't see that any time in the near future. But we're moving in that direction. We're moving in that direction. So artificial general intelligence is now using deep fake frauds using your voice. I don't know if you realize that only four words from a normal conversation can be used to generate a two-minute conversation. Now, as I was saying earlier, when I was sitting here with Dave and I kept getting those phone calls, and typically they usually, what, hang up right after that? First you say, who is this, or what, or can I help you, or whatever salutation or greeting you use when you first pick up the phone. All they need to use is a just a few of those words and if they use them enough, they can create an entire conversation out of that. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, let me back up just slightly. We haven't seen that here in Indian Head Park for the grandparent scam. Not that it's been reported. I can hazard a guess out of a population of 6,000. 6, we've had at least one grandparent that's had an AI-generated grandparent scam and has yet to come forward because of the embarrassment. And you shouldn't be embarrassed. Regardless of what type of a uh, scam, con, or fraud that it may be, please don't be embarrassed. Um, with that said, the grandparent scam has turned a whole new corner now. Instead of the fraudster going on, they go, hey, grandma, yeah, I'm, in, I'm in jail or I'm in Puerto Rico and I wrecked my car. Can you pay my doctor bill? And what does grandma grandpa usually, who is this? You know who this is. And what, what's, what usually comes right after that? Uh, oh, is this Johnny? Yeah, it's Johnny. Well, what did you just do? You gave the fraudster, or you gave the scammer, I should say, you gave them your name or Mary, whatever, the, whatever surname you may use. Now they're using artificial general intelligence. They're using a fake voice, a computer-generated voice. Or not computer, let me come back on that. They're using your voice to actually make that phone call. So it sounds exactly, it is you. Because you've spoken those words at some other time in the, in the future, they're now using them now in the past. Four words, a two-minute conversation. Video, please. Our top story, artificial intelligence giving parents a real scare. I had no doubt that it wasn't my daughter because it sounded just like her. Tonight, one mother's warning about what she thought was a life or death call. Good evening, I'm Mike Bush. Police say a number of people in St. Louis County have fallen victim to a frightening new AI phone scam where the caller sounds exactly like their child in distress. Five on your side's Andy Crawl spoke with one mom who received that traumatizing call and almost fell victim. Annie. Well, these recent AI-generated phone scams pretend there has been a car crash and someone's son or daughter has hit a person's bumper demanding money for the damage or they will kidnap their child. One of our victimized St. Louis County viewers remained anonymous on camera, still worried what scammers will do if they already have her phone number and daughter's voice. A call on the night of February 19th terrifying a St. Louis County family. What sounded like the oldest daughter crying after accidentally hitting a man's car turned into him demanding a $2,000 wire transfer at the Walmart in Manchester to an address in Mexico. Otherwise, their child would be kidnapped. So I had a lot of anxiety but was able to think properly. The mother messaging her other daughter for help while still on the phone with the man to quote, call 911 and track my cell phone. Later I typed kidnap. I didn't have time to think or to put my daughter's name or anything. Toward the end, they put my daughter back on the phone and it basically said, mom, do what they say. Her daughter's voice sounding so real. She never thought it was a scam. Police and computer engineers seeing more AI generated calls like this, saying it's not as simple as just hanging up the phone. It's really easy to say, but like that's an emotional moment, right? You hear from your child and you're upset. So you should talk with your family and you should have safe words or phrases or questions that you plan to ask if you wind up in this situation. Thankfully, two Manchester police cars arrived at the Walmart before this mother could make the transfer. Uh, they immediately grabbed my phone and said, who is this? And the guy said, who the F is this? And he said, this is officer so-and-so, and this is a scam. 
and then the individual on the phone said F you and hung up and I'm like, oh my God, they have my daughter. Experts say these scams come from AI programs, learning and processing information from online videos, meaning anyone who posts to social media can fall victim. You can use about you know, zero to three seconds of someone's voice and synthesize uh, any sentence you want that voice to say. That's why law enforcement is asking everyone to spread the word so other families aren't impacted. That woman was lucky, but we do know of local cases where parents did pay up and are now out thousands of dollars. AI phone scam warning signs include asking for gift cards or cryptocurrency and pressuring you to act quickly. If you think you're being scammed, officials urge you to directly contact the threatened family member, report the call to police, and file a claim with the Missouri Attorney General's office. Mike. Danny, thanks. Missouri Attorney General's office, because they refer you to us. But what we do want you to do on that, it adds some levity to this. I mean, it's some pretty heavy stuff I'm laying on everyone here this evening. And like I said, us, us. It's not you, it's us. Everyone in this room receives these things. So I'm learning along with you guys. I just happen to be the vessel to, to put the information out. So I'm learning right along with you guys. Trust me on that. But what we do want you to do on those, call the person who's in, uh, in trouble or who's asking for relief or any type of assistance, call them directly. Don't call the number that they provide you because it's not going to be the right number. That, that might be a little shocking, but just call them directly. But they're playing on your, your generosity to send that money, and what else are they playing on? They're certainly not playing on your greed. They're playing on your fear. It all comes down to physiology. That's the best way. That's how, I, how I'm uh, angling or you know, the, my edge into this type of this topic. It's based on physiology. When we go on vacation, or we may have a car rental due to an accident, and we're going to get that car rental uh, from Avis or Hertz or whatever, whichever uh, car rental company that you're going to be getting it from, a lot of us nowadays, through their infotainment system, will normally hook up our, and I like props, you normally hook up your device to it, correct? You normally hook your phone up to it. Well. What do you think happens when you're driving that car? All that information's in there. What do you think happens when you turn that car in? What's still in the car? Your contact list, your music lists, every, most if not everything that's in your device is now in the infotainment system. So if the rental car company doesn't do their due diligence and do a factory reset on the car before they rent that car out again, the next person that gets into your vehicle, the first thing that's probably going to pop up is your playlist, the last person that, that operated that motor vehicle. How many of you have actually been in a, in a, in a rental and you've had someone else's information pop up? I, I, I have. We have to make sure we keep our information on lockdown. We're going to go into that slide here very shortly. It also has all your contact lists, your locations visited. It's keeping a track through the GPS system. It wouldn't be hard for someone to recreate your entire vacation or your, your entire car rental experience through the info, info, uh, infotainment system of the rental vehicle. So we have to keep our information on lockdown through education. Remember, we can't remove the ability, we can't remove the desire, but we can remove the opportunity, and we remove the opportunity through education. Here's that slide, yes. Believe it or not, one of the number one ways of information getting out is from our own family members. Now, this could be information, they, they're gleaning your mail. I personally haven't worked any of the cases like that, but during my research and just trying to give you some more insight as to how our information is out there. We all know our information's out there. That's why I'm not getting, even getting into that. We, we're just gonna accept the fact that it's out there. We can't control that. You can go on those websites that'll scrub your name off the internet, but for every 10, 10 sites you take, you take it off, there's 15 more that it goes to. Every time you buy a car, you close on a house, that information becomes public information. It's out there. That's why I'm not drilling down into that, because we know it's there. I'm doing the backside of this. How does it get out there on a homegrown effort? Family members, how about when you come to our uh, pill dispensing machine, our uh, drug take-back uh, box here in the lobby of the police department? We have a drug take-back box. Please, if you have any unused prescription medication, please drop it off in there and it's destroyed in an environmentally responsible manner. Are you redacting or peeling the sticker off that, uh, that pill bottle? Because guess what's on there? Your first name, your last name, your doctor, your doctor's phone, the type of drugs, the milligrams. 
I certainly want anyone to know that I'm taking Pro. I'm not taking Prozac. <laughs> not, I'm not taking Prozac or Adderall. I certainly would not want anyone to know that, that I'm taking that. Now, granted, that probably goes, I know they incinerate that. It's incinerated. But you don't know who, who's working on the other end. That may be a ruse for someone. Yeah, I'm going to get hired by the drug place that disposes of this, and they're taking the bottles and taking their phone and taking a picture of the bottle, and now they got your information. They worked there for a day or two or three or a week or I don't know. I, I don't want to go out on too far of a limb. But would you really want your information out there? We have to keep our information on lockout. And as I had stated, the heading of that slide, there are databases throughout the world. Our Social Security number holds so much significance. Everything that you've done from the time that you were born and figuratively until the time you walked into this door tonight, auto purchases, home purchases, anything that was credit cards, that's all tied to your social security number. You wouldn't believe how many people are still carrying their social security card in their wallet or pocketbook or their purse. There is no reason on this side of heaven to have your social security number on you. There isn't. Keep it in a, in a lock box at home, in a strong box at a bank, a safety deposit box, wrap it in tinfoil, bury it in the backyard, put it someplace. But don't carry it with you. You're so, look at all the inf financial history, credit history. Everything is tied to your social security number. And we wonder why there is so much information out there. Some of it we can't help. Like I said, when you close on a house, that becomes a public and matter record. I can go down to Cook County Recorder of Deeds and uh, I'm just going to say you're Mrs. Smith. I can go down there right and not, I don't have to FOIA any of that, anything that's public. I can, I can just get that. I can just do a simple Google search. And speaking of that, you go a little just not off topic, but off the PowerPoint. If you ever have the opportunity, do it tonight. Please don't do it now because I hope you're talking, you're listening to me. Go into a Google or Bing or whatever. Go in whatever search, uh, Yandex, uh, DuckDuckGo, whatever search engine you use. Google yourself. I use Google as a general term. Google yourself or search yourself. You'd be surprised how much information is already out there on you. And as hard as you may try to keep it under, under wraps, there's something that's out there. Me, I'm all over, because I do public speaking not only here, but I do it outside of the police department, so I'm always doing presentations. I'm all over, my picture, my name, everything. There's not much I can really do about it. It's just a matter of time before I'm doxxed. Not that whoever's watching this, I want them to dox me. Now, doxing, what is doxing? Doxing is the taking of one's information, posting it for others to view, and it's basically slander and libel. And then your information's out there, and that can that could be horrendous, because if they get your credit information out there, your social security number out there, it's bad enough they can get your address and phone number, they can go sideways really quick. People can be threatened. People have been, uh, unfortunately, the, the, uh, the victims of a homicide because of that, because people came out to get them because they were doxxed, D-O-X-E-D, doxxed. Uh, it's tax season. Can't escape it. Like fear and, uh, I should say, like, um, was it uh, taxes and, and death, two things you can never escape. It's tax season. For emails, if you get anything in an email, I mean, Go through it. We're going to talk about what you should be looking for. Delete it. If it's if it's scanned, if that spidey sense, the hair in the back of your neck goes up, or the hair on your arm goes up, you get that that weird feeling in your belly. That's your body telling you something's not quite right. Guess what? It's not quite right. Just delete it. Then report it to the IRS at irs.gov, as well as uh, report your phishing and online scams. Uh, or let me roll back on that. Go to irs.gov. In the search bar, type in, I got it in bold in there, report phishing and online scams in the, in the, uh, the search bar. And it's going to have a drop-down menu where you can actually go and you can actually submit a report as to what you received on your machine. Conversely, if you receive a phone call, hang up. The IRS doesn't call you. They don't send you emails. They send you snail mail, U.S. Postal Service. That's the number one and the only way that the IRS will ever be contacting you. Now, I know after this presentation tonight, probably tomorrow, the next couple of weeks, I'm hoping that it isn't the case. That's just, just my job. That's what we do. We take these reports. People come in, and some people don't. They fall scam. They fall to the scam or fall to the roost. Um, here again, go to irs.gov, and it's, it's tricky to find. It's tricky to find. Those people at home are at a disadvantage because I'm going to show you. Go to irs.gov. Drop-down box is going to pop up. I want you to go to hotline. And that's how you're going to report that. If you receive a call for a hang-up, if you receive something in the, uh, in, as an email, go to irs.gov, type in report phishing and online scams in the search bar, and that's going to produce a drop-down box where you can then report that. 
we need you to report these things because believe now they may not necessarily investigate it i don't want to i'm not going to sell you i'm not going to pull wool over your eyes i'm being a, a, i would be doing you a disservice but what i can share with you is they warehouse that information if they start to see patterns and trends they can track that information so it's extremely important that you report that and we're going to talk a little bit more about reporting here in a little bit mail theft uh, all I can really say, we're going to try to sum up that slide as best I can. Don't use a collection box. Don't use a blue box. If you can wait until the next day, I'm going to go out on a limb here. President and my chief may kind of go, hmm, the box is even out here. I would bring it to the post office. I would err on the side of caution. Not that our box is bad, that anything to it has happened or is going to happen. But I'd rather give it to a human being rather than drop it into a box overnight at 10 o'clock at night and hope the next day at 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 o'clock the following day, it's still there. You saw the characters we got, we got a hold of at the very beginning of this presentation. I think they show up again. Can't be for certain. I, I don't recall. These people are, that's only one group. That's only one group. Deliver it to the post office. If you do receive mail in your mailbox at home, get it out as soon as you can, immediately. Granted, yeah, you're not going to run to the mailbox as soon as the mail hits the, hits the box, but get it out there within a reasonable period of time. The longer you let it sit there, the longer it's susceptible to theft and ultimately identity theft. Remember, we can't remove the desire, we can't remove the ability, but we can remove the opportunity. We have to remove that opportunity. If you're going to, uh, uh, if you really want to know, some of you probably are already on, on board with this, maybe you're not, go to ups.com and you can sign up for a, a preview of all that day's incoming mail. It'll send you a black and white grayscale photo, front and back of any of your mail packages, and you'll know exactly what's supposed to be coming to the house. Spoiler alert, if it doesn't come to your house, but yet you got the alert, hmm, something might be wrong. So you might want to check, check that out and find out why at 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock, it comes at a very specific time of the day. Um, by 10, 11, 12 in the afternoon, you haven't received it, but you got the grayscale image of it. You might want to look in it. It's going to give you a heads up. We want to arm you. We want to, we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, empowering you, self-advocacy. We want you guys to be the warriors. We want you to be the frontline warriors because when it gets to us, we're just taking a report. It, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm being realistic. Yes, there's things that we're doing being proactive. We're out there on patrol. We're looking for these characters, these unsavory characters. Yes, there's things that we are doing, but we need you to help us. We need you to help us. If you're going on vacation, go to ups.com. You could put a vacation hold on your mail. Say you don't want your neighbors to know what you're getting through the mail, go to ups.com. It's going to be held at the post office. Now, I've heard some naysayers. As a matter of fact, I heard them at the uh, Secret Service uh, presentation. Well, they don't always do it. No. Well, it's something. It's something, folks. We have, to, we have to at least try. We have to make a good faith effort to try to keep these characters from taking advantage of us, from taking advantage of us. And watch your mail carry. If you see something that's going on, so he's being followed, he's being uh, tagged, whatever it might be, call us. It could be something, it could be nothing. Err on the side of caution. You're not allowed so many phone calls a day or a month, a week, a year. Call us. We'll go out and check the guy out. Nine times out of ten, it's probably going to be nothing. But what if it's something that one time and you, you thought, ah, you know, I'll call tomorrow. Or I'm going to run it on social media first between 5,000 people and then five weeks later, I'll finally call. Got a lot of that in Westchester. For any of those in Westchester who are watching. Yeah, yeah, weeks later, weeks later. But I heard the gunshot, and I heard a scream, and a car peel away, but I won't get into that. Um, checks. This is the bane of my existence, and I talk, we talked about this earlier, <laughs> the chief and I. Well, here, we'll start off on the front end of this. Do I still write checks? Yes, I do. Do I put them in the U.S. mail? I got to... As you saw my eyes go up, which means I'm either, I'm thinking, no, the answer is no. Do I give one to my landscaper? Do I give one to my cleaner who comes into the house? I think there's only two that I could think of offhand. I'm being upfront with you. Why are we putting them in an envelope, dropping them off in a mailbox at 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night? Now, mind you, now mail collections usually, I don't know, 9, 10, 11, 12 o'clock the, the following day, 5 p.m. the next day, and then putting it in a mailbox, hoping that it might get there. We need to wean, and I know I'm talking to the, the perfect demographic here for checks. We need to start using electronic means of paying. Venmo, PayPal, Zelle. There's virtual, those are all virtual wallets. There's ways of transferring money from one person to the other without using checks. Those characters that we saw at the beginning, a lot of that stuff was in that mail fraud or that theft, 
they were, there were live checks in there they were taking. We're talking about check washing here in just a moment. They'll just change the dollar amount in the recipient, increase the dollar amount, make it out to them, go to a bank, cash it. Now they've got the cash in their account. And you're here two weeks later, or a week later, five days later, when you're going through your bank statement and you're itemizing it, and you're like, wait a second, I didn't take it. And you're, and you're across my interview room table and we're having this conversation. And I'm trying to do, I'm doing my, there's compassion, there's understanding. I'm having this conversation on a much smaller uh, scale with, with people when that does occur though, to try to impress upon them. But now they've been stung and unfortunately now they know. And it's, a, and it's after the fact as opposed to before the fact. So there's our online options. I'll look for bill paying options with bill, our uh, electronic uh, uh, options when you're paying up with bills. Almost every bill on the front of it, somewhere on there almost near the due date or thereabouts or the amount owed, there's a website or there's some way to pay electronically. Take advantage of that. It's right on there for you. You're not sending it to you know, Timbuktu. It's actually going to where they need to, it needs to go to. Take advantage of it as opposed to putting a check in there. And I have a thing, spoiler alert, for if you do send checks. We're going to get to that too. Electronic payment, as I said, which is a virtual wallet. Phone. A lot of times you could phone that payment in to the number that you're calling. Make sure it's the number that's on the bill and that, that number and that number alone. That number is going to get answered by whoever it is that's that generated that bill or whoever that's owed that money. Very bottom, in bold and in red, use credit cards to transact to make a transaction whenever possible. Especially if you're if you're travel uh, if you're going globally, or internationally, or purchase online with a debit card. If you lose the money on that, it's gone. It's just the same as somebody walking into the bank, taking it out of your account, and walking away with it. If you use a credit card, you have recourse. You have recourse now. So try not to use a debit card, use the credit card. Now I've torn up all my credit card, or cut my credit cards up, because I'm trying to be fiscally responsible with my funds, especially now that I'm retired. Um, moving forward with that, if I had to use a credit card, I would, most everything I pay for is, is local, so I'm using my debit card to pay for things that I need to pay for. But if you know you make purchases quite frequently, use your credit card versus a debit. As I said, credit, you have recourse. Debit, you don't. Once the money's gone, the money's gone. Credit, you have some recourse on that. Here we are going to go. We're talking the, uh, about sending checks safely to avoid that financial mayhem. You could send it either via UPS or FedEx. And here's the really cool thing about that. You can track it. So when you get that really nice fancy envelope, the nice cardboard envelope, they really got some nice stuff, you stick it in there, you seal it, you zip strip it, whatever, you put the address on, you go to FedEx or UPS, go to the location, or you do it remotely, you drop it, hand it, whatever the situation might be, you can now track that check. So say it's, it's, you're closing on a house, just a what if, a what ifism off the top of my head, and it's for a 10,000 or 8,000 or 500,000 or whatever it might be. If it's a substantial amount of money, FedEx or, U, or uh, uh, UPS it. You can also use the United States Postal Service and do the exact same thing. You can track the actual shipment, see where it's going and see where it's hitting. It's going to hit benchmarks from the time it's received until the time it's delivered. And you can actually track that check. Now, for those of you that want to send checks, and I know there's a, there's a lion's share of us that are going to mail them, that are going to be mailing them. I should probably emphasize that. We want to use a gel ink pen, a black gel ink pen. Well, why, Rob, do you want to use a, gel, a black gel ink pen? The gel absorbs into the paper. Now, is that to say that a scammer can't, still can't wash that with either acetone or use whiteout? I had one, yes, that I didn't put in this presentation. It, it was a horrible job on the photocopy. I didn't know what I was looking at. It looked like a puzzle. Um, they use whiteout. I'm like, get a little more creative. Nine times out of ten, they'll use acetone or some type of a chemical. It's going to make it harder for them to remove not only the payee, but also the dollar amount by using the black ink gel pen. It's not completely infallible, but we want to make it harder, right? We want to remove the opportunity. We can't remove the ability. We can't remove the desire, but we can remove the opportunity. Let's make it hard for these guys and gals that are doing this. Let's make them really work for it. It's sad that we actually have to have this conversation. I'm telling people how to write their checks, with specifically what type of pen. Have we digressed that much in society? Apparently, yeah, we have. It's a rhetorical question because we know the answer. Yes, we have, unfortunately. Could you play the video, please? 
Have you ever sent a check that was cashed, but the recipient said it never arrived? You may be the victim of check washing. Check washing scams involve changing the payee names and often the dollar amounts on checks, and then fraudulently depositing them. Hi, I'm Andre Avery, United States Postal Inspector. Occasionally, these checks are stolen from mailboxes and washed in chemicals to remove the ink. Some scammers will even use copiers or scanners to print fake copies of a check. In fact, postal inspectors recover more than $1 billion in counterfeit checks and money orders every year. But there are ways that you can protect yourself. Deposit mail before the last pickup. Give your outgoing mail to your letter carrier or deposit it at your local post office. Retrieve mail frequently. Never leave your mail in your mailbox overnight. If you're going on vacation, have your mail held at the post office or have it picked up by a friend or neighbor. And here's a tip for when you're writing checks. Use a gel pen. They have ink characteristics that are difficult to remove from checks. For more information, visit USPIS.gov. That pretty much sums that up as far as with the, um, with the check washing. And yes, acetone is one of the major or the primary um, solutions that they'll use in the check washing process. I think in the video they showed them what a, I think it was a Pyrex dish and they were in there moving it back and forth, agitating it to remove the ink. They then take that, use a photocopy machine, reproduce it, put the dollar amount, new payee, put it in their account and they're off to the races, unfortunately. And here again, the money's gone. The money's gone, but you need to report it. You need to report it, please, please. Uh, as I said, I think we're repeating, oh, this is the Hardwood Heights. Uh, the next video you're gonna see is from Hardwood Heights. This was just last, uh, late last year. It became so bad in Hardwood Heights that the post, the, I stand corrected, the police department put a sign next to the blue drop box, the primary one in their community, telling people, do not put your mail in me. Do not insert anything. Go directly to the post office. They were getting hit that bad. Understand, not only are the boxes being hit, the carriers themselves are being robbed. They're being jumped. They're the victims of battery. They're being beaten and having those keys we talked about earlier, you can also get them on the dark web, but they're also removing them off the, the mail carrier's person as well as the mail. The mail carriers are now being attacked. Truly, where, where, where have we gone? You may notice a rise in my voice there. I mean, where, where have we gone as a society where it's now acceptable to beat up the mailman? Yes? I used to work food stamp fraud with them, but that was years ago. Everybody's understaffed. However, a lot of our cases were on postal carriers. So I think the quality of postal carriers has changed as well. We, we, we uh, arrested them for narcotics and other things. So I think their focus might be on the carrier themselves as opposed to the general public. Now, years ago, I used to live at 101st of Washington. And right on the corner of my, my black uh, post office, uh, the postal carrier was, was held up at gunpoint. And that was 20 years ago. And the only reason I knew that is a guy that I used to work with became a postal inspector. So it's been going on for a long time. But I think your focus is more on their personnel than on the general public. In the last half of last year, they had, and I, I should have thrown it up as a, as a number, as a stat. I'm not a big one on stats, but we'll just spitball it on this one. There were more incidents of mail theft and postal carriers being assaulted in the last half of last year than there was at any time in the previous year, which have been 2022. Yeah, that speaks volumes as to what's currently going on. And the postal inspectors are out there inspecting. I don't want to besmirch the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. They're fantastic. Some of them are retired coppers. Some of them started off green and worked their way through the ranks there, and they're doing a great job. Um, but when you have these rings that are operating increasing in number, how, we just throw more bodies at it? I, I, 
my adage, my education, you can't remove the ability, you can't remove the desire, but we can remove the opportunity through education. I'm a firm believer in that. Even when I'm doing my cyber safety presentations with my kids, grades K through 12 and then even into college, removing the opportunity. Opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. Remove it. So this got so bad in Hardwood Heights last year that they uh, actually asked the uh, residents to actually avoid the blue box, go straight to the, um, to the mailbox. Could you roll that, please? Two new video just into the newsroom shows a thief swiping letters from a blue mailbox in the northwest suburbs. Police in both Norwich and Harwood Heights are tracking a surge of mail thefts and check fraud with at least 40 victims in the last six months. CBS 2's Tim McNicholas joins us live now from Norwich Village Hall with a warning for everyone in that area about what not to do with their mail. Tim? Joe, please say a thief got into this blue box just outside Village Hall, not once, but twice in the past three and a half months. Pretty brazen considering the police department is on the next block over. Both crimes caught on camera. Security videos from both May 25th and August 14th show a dark blue car pull up. Then someone gets out and opens the blue box, apparently with a key, before walking away with a handful of mail. And this is not the only blue box thieves are targeting. They changed the name. Lou Spiels dropped off a check to pay her water bill in this blue box outside this post office in Harwood Heights, the town right next to Norwich, only to become a fraud victim. Very frustrated. She dropped off the $94 check in early May. Then, earlier this month, $6,000 were withdrawn from her account. She learned someone somehow had stolen the check, changed the recipient name, the date, and the dollar amount. My heart stopped pounding because I could not understand why I was overdrawn. Norwich police say they've taken 40 mail theft reports so far this year. The department posting a warning to Facebook, telling people to skip the blue box and bring mail right into the post office. It's the kind of crime we've investigated for the past year, from the northern suburbs to the south side. So today, we called postal investigators again to ask why it keeps happening. And again... The mailbox of the person you are calling is currently full. It should not happen. You know, you relied on the post office to take care of your business. And another reason police believe a thief might have a key is because there wasn't any damage to this blue box even after the thefts. So now police are investigating how someone might have gotten hold of a postal key. Meanwhile, as for Spiels, well, she's waiting on Fifth Third to finish investigating her case and hopefully refund her account. Live in Norwich, Tim McNicholas, CBS 2 News. I just did that phone call thing and it went to voicemail. I personally, that didn't sit with me too well. He was like trying to do a gotcha, like try calling him again. So any of those of you United States Postal Service or inspectors, I got your back on this one. I don't, th I think that was, that wasn't right. And if Channel 2 wants to call, they'll talk to the chief. Um, but yeah, that wasn't, I don't, he shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have done that. Anyway, uh, sending your check safely. Uh, if you're going to send the check, I'm, I'm beating this like a dead horse only because we had this happen here. Like I said earlier, it doesn't happen somewhere else. It's happened here. If you're sending a check to someone, remain in contact with them. Find out if within the next day or two or three they received it. Don't send it, you know, don't do a send it and forget it. Keep in contact with them. Find out if, in fact, they actually received it at some point. Keep only enough in your checking account uh, to cover that, those particular bills or at least the account that you're actually writing the checks on because if they go back, and I'll use the, that lady for example, 6,500. I don't know about anyone in this room. I, 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 that check would have bounced had they wrote check for 6,500. I'd be like, I don't have that. Um, but if you do, you could see how severe that could be. So only keep the amount of money in the, your checking that you're writing those checks for and keep them in a separate account, the balance, the lion's share of that. So you, it's not such a big hit. It's not such a big hit. You're trying to avoid that big hit. And then, of course, avoid making checks out to cash uh, and write them out to a specific business. That's, a lot of that's rudimentary. Now, this one, I got to do some backfill on this. Um, this was September of 2023. This was my first experience here, um, yeah, even before I was in Westchester, with mail theft. Now, thankfully, this is over in Ashbrook. Spoiler alert. Ashbrook, um, actually, we're watching it as it happens, so I'll talk through it. That silver car there, you can see it's slowly moving. That's either a 15 
or a 20 cluster mailbox. I can't remember exactly how, a cluster mailbox. Cluster mailboxes, they're all attached together. There's 15 or 20 of those in there. And the guy drives off. Could you, you know, you can't rewind that, can you? No. I think everybody was watching that. Um, that was a Nest or a Ring camera that was in the, uh, in the window across the street. Just dumb luck that we happened to get the, uh, obtain that footage. The best to my knowledge, we had some leads on these char on character that was doing this. I thought for sure that the Palos Heights situation would have been this, but none of the mail came back out of Ashbrook. So as a reasonable and prudent person, I, would, I came to the conclusion, Rob, probably wasn't Ashbrook that these guys were hitting, that Palos got due to that alert officer, can't give him enough credit in Crestwood to get those guys. So what does that mean? There's two different rings running. We only got one. There's, they hit the west side of Wolf Road. This guy's hitting the east side of Wolf Road in Ashbrook. And we're trying to do the best we can on these things. We really, truly are. We work with other agencies. We try to get the information. We do use our flock cameras. There's a lot of time and energy that go into these investigations. So we're working these. That was mail that was delivered. They came, but this is early a.m. On a, on a Sunday. They left it overnight. I know I'm on the mic. I don't, they, they left it overnight. You need to retrieve your mail immediately. Do we have, well, I won't say who's from Ashbrook. I don't want to, I don't, if I inadvertently, I'm not putting anyone on the spot, but that was Ashbrook. I'm just curious as to what the mindset is. Well, I got a great way to prevent that. And I talked to, um, I'm drawing a blank on Ashbrook, who's our HOA president. Yes, Mr. Eck. And I sent him this, and they're actually going to be removing those. This was my first attempt, or my first uh, solution, for lack of better words. Short term. One second. Anyways, he's one. Got to play it. Um, they're actually going to remove those cluster boxes and put them with the locked boxes. That's just a cluster that's locked versus a cluster that's open. I had to learn to, learn to use cl uh, the cluster. I didn't know what those were called. They're called cluster mailboxes. Had to do my research. I had to get, I have to educate myself on this. Here's a great way to thwart that for those of you in Indiana Park, and I know there's a lot, if not everyone, who has a traditional mailbox. Hello everyone, Vic here again. Uh, hopefully you never come home to find your mailbox looking like this. I just opened mine to show you. Uh, we've had a lot of mailbox theft lately, and a quick solution for that is a locking mailbox insert. These inserts fit right inside your existing mailbox. And lock up. And I'm going to show you how to bolt them in place. The trick when placing this, uh, we have a 7 inch mailbox as you can see here. 7 inch internal dimension. Um, it's good to get 3 quarters of an inch on either side. and about three quarters of an inch there. It's also important enough to get this unit far back enough to where you can drill the hole and not touch the welded seam of the mailbox. Uh, so you're just drilling into sheet metal. And you also want it, don't want it too far back because you want to be able to open the door. Uh, if you put it too far back, you won't be able to open the door all the way with the key in it. Now that I have the hole marked, I can drill with a 3 8 inch drill bit. Now that we have our hole drilled, put the insert in like so. So the screws in from the top. We have a locking washer, a locking nut, and a washer that go in from the bottom. Just attach the locking nut from the bottom along with the washer. Tighten it with a one half inch socket. Naysayers. Well, they could just take the bolt and unscrew it, and I quite yeah, they could do that. They could also just take the whole post out of the ground and throw that in the back of a truck too. All right. As I said earlier, even with the black ink gel pen, nothing is infallible. Nothing's a hundred percent. But what are we trying to remove? We're trying to remove the ability. Well, we can't remove the ability. We can't remove the desire. But we can remove the opportunity. 
I'm just giving you guys some tools for the toolbox. Because unlike Westchester, all of our mailboxes are connected to the house. It's a, right through the wall or through the door. This is a very unique, unique community. It's a very beautiful community. It's a very nice community. I'm really, I, I'm, it's, a, it's a pleasure to work here. Um, I, you all have that. I call them the Mayberry ma mailbox. Everyone has one. Most everyone has one. We have to be proactive. We have to be proactive in this. If we were hit once, we were hit twice, this is going to continue until we can either remove the mail on time, stop sending checks, put these devices in, any combination thereof, so we can prevent this from happening. We've got to remove the opportunity. Um, I'm going to go through this, not really fast, but fast enough. Uh, when you receive an email, anything by pointer does not work. The lasers won't work on a TV, so I'm going to actually have to go through the TV. It's in bold in here. It's HTTPS colon for two forward slashes. Most emails, actually any email that's legitimate will start off with that. So that's going to be in the address bar or the URL, URL bar, URL or address bar uh, at the very top of your screen, website, whatever it might be. It does not guarantee that the website is malicious or that, or that it's a scam, but at least it's a start to see that. At least it's a start. Now we're going to go through some examples, and these are ones that I have personally received. I'm going to stand here only because, like I said, the laser doesn't work on the screen. At the very top, emboldened, I put down the name of the, uh, this is supposedly with um, Apple support. If you look at the front part, man, receipt payment, we're doing okay. We get to at, at, you're pretty safe there. Well, look at what follows after the at. Does anything on there tell you or indicate that it's from Apple support? Mm, I'm going to say, nah, that ain't real. Once more, this is from PayPal. All right, Cher Ulrich. At, we're doing pretty good up to the at. Where it always falls apart is after the at. And that one's t-online.de. I'm hazarding a guess that's not from PayPal. I'm going to go on a limb. This one's from Xfinity. And these are ones I've received. Um, and some of them I redacted. Yeah, I redacted whatever I needed to redact. Uh, home 209, we're doing good. COX.net. I highly doubt that's an Xfinity Comcast. SunTrust, same thing, Com at Comcast.net. I don't think a bank is going to use a Comcast.net. It's either going to be SunTrust.com or SunTrust.org or something along those lines, but Comcast.net, I'm going to say, I'm going to call, uh, I'm going to call foul on that. And on this one here, it's uh, Apple ID suspended. Yeah, this is one of mine. I redacted my email. Um, Apple EID at, now this, now this is on the front end of it. So conversely, not can we have it happen on the back end of it, but on the front end of the ad, a Apple ID dot TL3U, I mean, does that even look remotely anything like that? No, no. So me and the chief have gone over this multiple times, and we're both in, we're both in lockstep with this. And we're going to go just a few more slides. We're on the back end of the presentation, folks. Uh, if you need clarification about something, come out. Give us a call. We'll come to the house, or you can come here. If you feel that having a squad car in front of your house or in front of the, the, the apartment complexes is, is somewhat off-putting, or you got the Mrs. Krivitz that's going to be pulling the curtain, what's going on over there? Come into the station. You have some anonymity. We'll help you. I know what I'm going to do, and I know my colleagues are watching this video. I know they're watching it. I'll sit you down. I'll bring you into our... We have a very small department, and I know none of you are going to do anything nefarious. I'll bring you into our roll call room, our, 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 our report room. I'll have you sit next down to me when we're quiet and things are kind of, you know, calm down in the station. We'll sit next to you. I'll help you walk through whatever the problem is by logging on. The Westchester was a little bit different. It was a different animal. Bigger department, more stuff going on, more activities, a little more homier. That's the, that's the sense. That's the feel I get of it here. We're going to give you a little more extra special attention, for lack of better words. At least I am. I'm hoping the other officers will, and I know they will as well, too. They don't want to see anyone fall victim to a scam or a con. Um, th this is all, these, this last slide is all going to be on these sheets that are up here. Uh, monitor your credit report. I, this is the mantra I chant to everyone. Any, if anyone here has ever come in to do, do a uh, scam, con, or fraud report with me, I rattle this off. Uh, I, I say this stuff in my sleep. You want to request a copy of your credit report. Now, here's the interesting part. Up until just a few short months ago, you could only get one free credit report a year. Now, it's a week. What does that tell you? A week. A week. Let me, I'm going to say it another time. A week. We've gone from a year to a week. 
there's a lot going on that the that this organization figure no we got to give these these things to people weekly weekly now please understand when you're when you become the victim of a scam counter fraud and you go on to their whatever is going to be happening or possibly happen it's not going to happen within the next day or two or three so you might want to check want to push out a couple months maybe a year maybe a year or two maybe not quite that far i think you know what i'm trying to get at so don't say you want it the next day up oh, everything looks good and i mean go through it with a fine-tooth comb Typically, the way they'll send you that, you can either requ uh, request it online or by phone. They're going to send it to you electronically. The best way to read, because it is, it's like the Gutenberg Bible. I mean, you could sit on it for like, like a city phone directory, depending on how much history you have. Copy it off, and then clip it, staple it, whatever you want to do, put it in a three-ring binder, and then sit there with a highlighter. And your eyes might start bleeding, but do a little bit each day. And you're going to see a lot of things on there. Wells Fargo, Chase Bank. Oh, yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, what's this one? Could be from 15 years ago. Then your memory is going to kick in and go, oh, that was when we bought the, the swimming pool. We had the pool put in from uh, Pool Brothers or whatever it may have been. Then you're going to see some ones on there that are questionable. Those are the ones we want you to drill down into. Because now you're, you've, if you've already been the victim of identity theft, you have to keep eye on your credit report. Second thing I tell people to do, go to mysocialsecurity.com and go to ssa.gov forward slash my account and open up a my social security account. I'll say it one more time, my social security account. It's on the sheets up here. Everyone can grab one on the way out. You want to check your social security number because once more, if you've been the victim or the target of identity theft, they're using everything about you. First name, last name, address, date of birth, credit card information, banking information, and your social security number. We have to keep tabs on that as well. This is what we want you to do when they say report to the FBI. No, you're not reporting to Agent Smith, downtown city of Chicago, because he's probably going to look at you and his eyes are going to roll and he's going to develop a migraine. We're going to go through the IC3.gov, IC3. Why IC3? Internet Complaint Center. That's the three C's. IC3.gov. And you can uh, file a complaint or a report there. That's how we, 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 that is how we report properly to the FBI. You do it electronically through the IC3.gov website all on these sheets. Third, uh, we also want to report to the FTC, ftc.gov. You're going to select report identity theft or report fraud and then file a complaint. They, just as I said with the United States Postal Service, they warehouse this information. They start to see trends, patterns uh, in certain geographic areas or a certain specific area or they're building a case. The FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, needs this information as well. Ooh, that is the four. Um, and your report is going to help stop other, other scams stop. And last but not least, please, and if you have a hard time setting up a Facebook account, you're like, oh, I don't want to do Facebook, I don't do social media, that's the cover page for our uh, Indian Head Park Police Department Facebook page. Yes, I manage the page. It's not a, a self-gratuitous remark I'm making here. But what I'm getting at is there is a ton of information that I put on there that I think you guys can use. Anyone who's been on it, I'm telling you, here I'm not. Pat myself on the back. This is, this is for you guys. It's not for me. Well, remember I said earlier, it's us. So I learn too. So you know what? I just had an epiphany. So when I post that, I'm learning before I post it. Like, wow, that, that sharpens my skills. That sharpens my, the knives in my drawer. So I'm a little sharper on this. And I'm going to share it with you. Please open an account once more. If, you, if you're somewhat apprehensive about opening up a social media account, spe uh, specifically Facebook, come in the station. I'll show you how to do it and you don't have to give all your pertinent information. You don't even have to put a picture, you don't have to put anything. At a minimum, at a minimum, set up a Facebook account. A lot of information from the police department comes from there. This slide is very important. Why is it important? It has my last name, my email address, and my phone number with extension. Just like when I do my cyber safety pre presentations with the kids. The kids are a little bit different. I tell them, I need an adult to call me first. You guys don't need an adult to call me. Call me. Now, it's, it's an extension. And spoiler alert, yeah, on occasion, I may give out my cell phone. I know. Some of the guys who are watching this probably going to oh, oh, be still in my heart. That's when you develop a really good relationship with, with people who I know. But we're going to start with a cell phone with a phone extension. Because I'll be honest with you, it's hard sometimes to do the phone, the, the, the phone uh, email or the uh, voicemail messages, voicemail messages. Calling me direct sometimes works out better, but that's on the other side of this. Email, phone, uh, I have the cryptocurrency scam sheet on the, on the table, as well as all of those four points that I want you to check out, FTC, Social Security, FBI, and IC3. 
It's all on the sheet. And with that, I'm going to say good night and thank you so much for coming out. Again, thank you, Rob. There was a great presentation. It's a lot of information I know. This presentation will be on the website, correct? Yes, on the, so website well. on the village website so you can view it again because there's a lot there. And again, if it doesn't seem right, please call us and we'll take a look at it for you. Okay, thank you. Any questions?